and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let us pray in the words that Jesus, our Savior, taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Today we celebrate the feast of Pope St. John the 23rd. Speaking of which, does anyone know how many popes have been named John? <laughs> <A lot>. <laughs> <laughs> Remember, the Catholic Church may not always be the most practical machine, or the most creative, but she is the most practical. So how many popes have been named John? Just John? 23. <laughs> 23, just John. How many have been, have the name John in their, you know, in their, in their name? John Paul. 25. That's right, 25. Pope John Paul I, Pope John Paul II, and then the 23 that have had the name John. A couple things about John the 23rd. Here are three things you should know about him. One, he was born to peasants, to sharecroppers. And as I mentioned at Mass, this is what I love about the Catholic Church. Even Napoleon made the quip that it's only in the Catholic Church that an emperor and the, a servant are treated the same. So we have, and we see that with John the 23rd. Basically, he came from a poor background, and he made it all the way, in a sense, to, to Pope. So that's kind of a neat thing. He took as his motto, obedience and peace. Obedience and peace. And so, in a sense, if you want... Peace, not necessarily happiness, because no, God doesn't promise us happiness in this life, but if you want peace, then you need to be obedient to God in His will. And the third thing that we talked about as far as you know, Pope John the 23rd goes, you know, that he was poor, you know, he was raised up to the age of Pope, he had the obedience and peace as his motto, and he started the Second Vatican Council. And with him, the idea was he was just going to let some fresh air into the church, and of course the Holy Spirit takes over, and you know, things really got, you know, changed. We still see the fruits of that today. So he's been, um, he was a wonderful Pope. He was just canonized not too long ago with Pope John Paul II. They were canonized together. So, those are anything else that we should say about, and he's very big into the ecumenical movement, bringing the non-Catholics into the Catholic Church, trying to reconcile whatever the Protestants were protesting about to bring them in, to reunite them back to the Catholic faith. So he's very big in the ecumenical movement. Is there anything else, Bill, that... Well, he was, when he opened the council, his first address says, we're not here to change any kind of doctrine, because that's set, you know, everybody agrees on that, that he wanted to um, address the methods in which it is proclaimed, so that would be more, um, I suppose, acceptable or reasonable <laughs> uh, to the modern world, you know. So he wanted to, when he said, to, like, we need to open the windows, you know, so that he wanted really <clears throat> for the church to be more relevant to the lives that people were living at that time. Um, history has a way of playing tricks, though, because uh, the time was the 1960s, <laughs> and there's a lots of stuff going on in culture wars, you know, that um, it just happened to coincide with the, the Second Vatican Council that he called, um, and so it made things very difficult. And when when he was elected, he was 78 years old, so many people thought he'd just be a transitional pope, you know, kind of a kind of see how things would go and play out, and then the next pope would be elected shortly after that, but it wasn't actually until you know, a couple years later that we had the next pope. So anyway, that's Pope John XXIII, very holy man. Today, we want to talk about the Sacrament of Confirmation. Before we do that though, just to review, hopefully everyone knows what RCIA stands for. What does RCIA stand for, Jack? Variety of Christian Initiation for Adults. Okay, Variety of Christian Initiation of Adults. Very good. If we were to define a sacrament, a sacrament is an outward 
sign. sign. Instituted by Christ. Entrusted to the church to give grace. Very good. And what is grace? What is grace? Every grace is a wonderful thing. What is it though? What is grace? Very simply, it is a share in God's life. So every good thing you do is because of grace. Every bad thing you do is because you you haven't utilized the grace that God wants to give you. Bible is a Greek word which means books. Again, the Catholic Church may not always be the most creative, but she's the most practical. So if you're going to put 73 books into one, you might as well call it books, or in Greek, Bible. In 393 AD, who officially put the Bible together in the form that we have it now? The Catholic Church. Who gave us the seven sacraments? Remember the very definition, it's an outward sign instituted by Christ. So who gave us the seven sacraments? Jesus. 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 Hopefully, can everyone list the seven sacraments? Tiffany, can you list the seven sacraments? No. <laughs> <laughs> can you list the first sacrament? Um, communion. Okay, communion is one of them. Very good. Jack, can you list another sacrament? Baptism. Okay, that would be the first one. Excellent. Now, what, in the order, what comes in between baptism and communion? Confession. Confession. Okay, very good. And what comes next? Confirmation. Then you have what is called... The vocational sacraments. Vocation is your calling from God. So another sacrament would be matrimony. Okay, matrimony. Another vocational sacrament would be holy orders. Holy orders. And the last sacrament is my sick. Of these sacraments, of those sacraments, which ones have you seen only once in your lifetime? Baptism. Okay, baptism. Holy orders. Holy orders and confirmation. confirmation. How come marriage isn't listed on there? I thought you could only be married once. What's up with that? I thought you could only be married once. How come marriage isn't on there, Tiffany? Until um, death do you part. That's right, until death do you part. So, you can get married again if your spouse dies. So in a sense, you can get married a hundred times as long as your spouse dies. <laughs> hundred times. So, so like, like, what if um, you got married and like later in life, like they started cheating on you and like abusing you and stuff like that? Like, what happens okay. then? Sure, that's a good question. If, if your spouse is unfaithful, what the church looks at is. What is missing before you got married? To say, because it has to be a sacrament. So it's not necessarily what happened afterwards, even though that might be, you know, identify what was missing before. So the church looks at, if you get a divorce, what was missing, you know, if to not be a sacrament, what was missing before? So if they're unfaithful, do they have a history of being unfaithful? Or if you thought this was the person you're marrying, and it turns out it wasn't. So they deceived you into who they really were. So the church looks at those things. And just because someone is unfaithful afterwards doesn't mean it's an invalid marriage. Because mm -hmm. again, the vows say, in good times and bad sickness and health, so death you part. So the church looks at you know, what is missing beforehand. And some of the things that maybe happened after you got married could indicate you know, this is a pattern. Okay. Does the church, and we, this really isn't on marriage, but I know we're going to lose you here in, <laughs> in another week. Does, if you're married to an abusive spouse, do you have to stay married to the abusive spouse? No. No, because in really, you don't have to remain, continue to get abused. You, you, obviously, you pray for the person, but doesn't necessarily invalidate the, the marriage. And really, 
if you get a civil divorce, it has no power to break the bond. It just says that you're no longer legally, no longer bound to one another legally. But the problem is, once we get the divorce, we think, oh, I'm free to marry. That's not what a divorce decree does, because if there's a bond there, no power on earth can break it. Not the Pope, not the Church, not the courts, not the state, not the president, not the individuals. So that's why the Church takes it very seriously. It's, it's like a, a court case when they look at every marriage to find out, is this, was this a valid sacramental marriage or not? Why these three sacraments? Why those three sacraments? Baptism, confirmation, holy orders. Why those three? Indelible mark on your soul. Okay. Because those three sacraments leave an indelible or a permanent mark or seal character on your soul. And once you have that mark on your soul, it is there forever. It can never be erased, removed, worn off. Even if someone says, I don't want to be baptized anymore, we still have that mark on your soul. We can't see our souls, but you could, when you're baptized, that mark is there forever. So again, can't be burned off. So even in the eternal fire, the devil, devil knows who's been baptized or confirmed or even ordained. Father, yes. um, last time I think you said that you can lose the grace of the sacrament, but not the mark on your soul. Can you explain that? Sure. With every sacrament comes a certain grace to kind of help you live out whatever that sacrament. So baptism obviously makes you a child of God. It gives you the grace to live out as a child of God. But if you commit a mortal sin, you still have that mark on your soul, but that grace has been lost. And so that's why if you notice people who are living in sin have a tendency to be more irritable or cranky or you know, disagreeable. It's because they don't have the grace that they once had in their soul. So the way that grace is restored is through the sacrament confession. So again, you have that mark will always be there, but you may not always have the grace that you receive. But the, it's very simple to get that grace restored by going to the sacrament confession. Very good. So the sacraments of initiation, baptism, confirmation, and Eucharist. So initiation means when you're fully initiated or incorporated into the Catholic Church. So if anyone in here has been baptized at the Easter Vigil, you would receive all three of those sacraments at one time. Baptism, Confirmation, and the Eucharist at the Easter Vigil. If you've already been baptized, you receive Confirmation and the Eucharist. So those are the sacraments of initiation that fully incorporate you into the Catholic faith. So do you have a question? In Greek, what does baptism mean? In Greek, what does baptism mean? Uh, even if you had no idea, <laughs> you could roll out books. Why is that? Bible. Bible. I don't think we've covered the sacrament of the of Thanksgiving yet, <laughs> which is the Eucharist. Mm -hmm. And one God in three persons, what is the word for that? Oh, Trinity. Trinity. Or the Trinity. Okay. One God, three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So the only one that could be is one Churmers. So again, the Catholic Church may not be the most creative, but she is the most practical. So if you're being plunged into water, you might as well call it baptism in Greek. What are the fruits of baptism? The forgiveness of original sin and any personal sin. Typically, we baptize babies, but if someone is baptized after seven years of age, any personal sin would be wiped away as well. That we're made members of God's family, we become members of Christ's body, the church, and we're made temples of the Holy Spirit. And that's why as Christians, as Catholics, we can truly call God our Father. Because through our baptism, we are made adopted sons and daughters. What does it mean to say the sacraments are efficacious? What does it mean to say the sacraments are efficacious? Are they efficacious? <laughs> Absolutely. They are efficacious because they confer effect the grace they signify. They are efficacious because Christ is at work in them. So if you had never seen a baptism before, or if you have, you would see water being poured on the baby. So it's, what do you, someone might say, look, the baby is being washed. So what you see taking place on the outside, in a sense, is the effect that's taking place on the inside. So on the inside, what is being washed is your is your soul. And what is it being washed of? Sin. sin. So any personal sin or any original sin that is all being washed off. 
And of course, in every sacrament, it is really as if Jesus himself, because it is Jesus himself, who is conferring that sacrament on you. Simply put, why did Jesus come, suffer and die, and rise three days later? To conquer sin and death, open the gates of heaven, which have been closed since the fall of Adam and Eve. In baptism, to immerse someone in the water is a sign of what? The immersion out of the water is a sign of what? And so when you're immersed in the water, plunged, basically it's a sign of dying, burial with Christ. And when you're brought out of the water, it would make sense that it would be his, his resurrection. Rising with Christ. Does the Catholic Church recognize Protestant baptisms? Yes. Every, every Protestant baptism, or does it really matter? Because with form and the right form. <laughs> right? Has to be done with the right form. And right, what is the right form? Father, Son, and Holy I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Okay, where does the Catholic Church get that? Why don't we just say I baptize you in the name of Jesus? Why don't we just say I baptize you in the name of Jesus? Why don't we say I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Where does that even come from? When Jesus told them to do it, he That's right, in Matthew 28. So in the New Testament, when he tells them to go out and baptize, we use a Trinitarian formula, which is I baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Jesus didn't tell the apostles, baptize in my name. He said, baptize in the name of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And again, remember, we are baptized into a family and not a function of God. So we don't say I baptize in the name of the Creator, Redeemer, and Sanctifier. So whatever your dad does, can you imagine? Tiffany, what did your dad do? What did your dad do? In your for work. What's that? Yeah, for work. He's an iron worker. An iron worker. So when you came home from school, did you go, hi, iron worker, when you no. came home? <laughs> you probably said, hello, dad, or hi, dad. Well, it's the same way. We don't say, hi, creator, even though God is creator and redeemer and sanctifier. We say, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we also recognize Protestant baptisms, not if they use a Trinitarian formula, but if they use plain, natural water. Or whether it's sprinkling, or plunging, or pouring over the head. That's why, so if someone is non-Catholic, is a Protestant, and they come into the Catholic Church, can we baptize them again? No, no if they meet these conditions, and we're certain of it, then they wouldn't have, they couldn't be baptized again, because once you're baptized. Any questions on that, that one, that aspect? Why do we have godparents? What's the purpose of godparents? Are they really even necessary? Just kind of get up there, build good up there. <laughs> so everything we do in the church makes sense, and there's a purpose. So they assist the parents in making sure the grace of baptism is unfolded and nurtured by the parents and the community. They're sorry to help safeguard and develop. To be someone to be a sponsor, they have to meet certain conditions. What's the condition? What's the condition? you think might be have to meet? What's the condition? Catholic. Okay, you have to be Catholic. Alright, so you have to be Catholic. That's a good place to start. <laughs> what else? Be at least 16. You have to be at least 16 years of age. So Catholic and 16. What else? They have to have received three different sacraments. Which three sacraments do they have to receive? Jack, what sacrament do you think they have to receive? Baptism. Okay, baptism. What else? Confirmation. Confirmation and? Eucharist. The Eucharist. So they have to be fully incorporated, initiated in the church. Okay. And if they are married, their marriage has to be blessed or recognized by the church. And it can't be the mother and father. Again, it's just one male and one female. There's a reason why we call them godparents. So even though it's not politically correct, two men cannot be parents, two women cannot be parents. It's one male and one female. <coughs> they are parents. And this is, I don't know if we've necessarily got to this, but we'll just see how far along we are. In the church, there are six different colors, liturgical colors that you would see. What color is worn during Advent and Lent? It's kind of a penitential color. Any idea? The season is quickly approaching. Purple. Okay, purple. This color is worn at Christmas and Easter. Sign of the resurrection, purity, birth, rebirth. That is white. 
This color is worn on Good Friday, Palm Sunday, Pentecost, and the Masses of the Holy Spirit, the Feast of Martyrs. That would be red. red. This color is worn on Sundays in ordinary time. It's the color of hope. Green. Green. Okay. And then this color is for joy and rejoicing, oftentimes confused with pink. We do not wear pink in the church. <laughs> Rose. And then the last one, this color may be worn at funerals and on All Souls Day is the color of sadness and mourning. And that is black. Black. Father, yes. when did the church change the uh, Good Friday from black to red? It was before my time because I've only known it as... Okay. That is Does it, what season, by this chart, what season are we in right now? Or there are times when you come to Mass on Sunday, the priest is dressed in green. What does that mean, ordinary time? Right, there is 52 Sundays in the traditional year, but in the Catholic Church calendar, ordinary time means the if there's not another season. So there's roughly 33, possibly 34 Sundays in ordinary time. Why is there only 33 or 34 Sundays in ordinary time? In a, regular, in a sense, a regular church season. Because there's other stuff going on. <laughs> but you're right, because Advent, you have four, four Sundays of Advent. Lent is six weeks, so you have six Sundays. You have the Christmas and Easter season. So ordinary time means basically the regular church season outside of these kind of special times that you have just identify because the church has other things going on. Okay. Which is a good question. You know, why do we have the different se in a sense, why do we have different seasons or called ordinary time? So in a sense there's nothing ordinary about the mass. It's just the regular church season. And that we don't have something extraordinary going on like Lent and Advent, Christmas, <coughs> Easter. Yeah, I wondered about that when I first started coming to church because they would always say it's blah, blah, blah in ordinary time. That's right. Okay. So this, speaking of which, does anyone know what this Sunday coming up is or what last Sunday was? What, how many, which Sunday of ordinary time was that? It was the, <coughs> what's that, Bill? 28th, I think. That's right. It was the 28th Sunday of ordinary time. So this Sunday would be the 29th Sunday of ordinary time. If you look at confirmation, your confirmation always follows your baptism, but not always immediately. If you look at if you look at this picture, what's something that stands out in that picture? There should be several things that stand out. Deb, what's one thing that stands out in that picture? Well, the age of the we're receiving exactly. okay. is a bishop conferring the... Right, it's a bishop who confirms, mm -hmm. and he would normally do it, but obviously the Easter Vigil, the priest does it because there's no way the bishop could be... We have 63, 62 parishes in our diocese. No way he could be at 62 parishes. So that has been delegated to the priest. So one is the bishop is doing it. What else stands out? Beth, what's something that stands out in that picture? The sponsor behind the Okay. Then notice the sponsor is there, and she has her right hand on the right shoulder. So she hopefully has been guiding that person through her formation in preparation for the sacrament. So you have a sponsor, you have the bishop. What else stands out, Jack? What's something that stands out? It kind of just hits you all at once. If you look at the picture, it's like... What stands out in that picture for red? That's right, red. Why would they wear red for... Why would they wear red for confirmation? Okay, for the Holy Spirit. Again, symbols are very important in, for us as people, not just as Catholics, but as people. So one of the things that stands out is red because it's a kind of the color of fire. And so the Holy Spirit is descended down upon the confirmandi. So that's why you would see typically red. doesn't have to be, but typically red is worn at confirmations. So you have the bishop, you have the sponsor, you have red. There's a couple other things that stand out in this picture. She's being anointed. Okay, she's being anointed. So there's a special oil. What's the name of that oil again? Does anyone remember? The name of the oil. That's right, very good, the sacred chrisms. 
So you have the sponsor, you have the bishop, you have the bread, you have the oil, the location. It should the sacraments should take place in God's house because we're being baptized into God's family, we're being confirmed into the Catholic faith, into God's family. So again it should take place in the church. And if there's anything else that stood out. Well, there you go. I think we covered. I just like this cartoon. <laughs> it says, no fancy in Solomon do not have 300 porcupines. <laughs> so if you, and the reason I put this in here too, is sometimes I know what I'm talking about. At least I think I know what I'm talking about. But sometimes you may, it may not be clear to you, but obviously I've been ordained a priest 20 years. I've been Catholic 50 years. So and it's clear to me, but it may not be clear to you, or something may not make sense. So if you have questions, by all means, you'll let me know. What is the matter of baptism? What is the matter of baptism again? Water. Water. So it's what you have to have to have a valid baptism. You will see at your, for those who would be baptized at the Easter Vigil, You'll see all these things and they're important, but all you have to have for valid baptism is just plain, natural water. What is the form of baptism? What are the words used? I baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit again. Where do we get it from? Jesus Himself. Matthew 28, 19. Okay, moving forward with confirmation. Yeah, you know, it Table. Do you need something to write with? You don't have to get out. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I told her we would bring them over. So if you want to take a few minutes, you can work on this together, look things up in the catechism. We want to make sure everyone is proficient, that they know how to use the catechism of the Catholic Church. Apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God. They sent them Peter and John, who went down and prayed for them, that they might receive the Holy Spirit. They had not yet fallen upon any of them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. <coughs> so what's something that stands out in that passage? <coughs> what's something that stands out in that passage? Patsy? Had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Okay. Not the Trinity. Okay, very good. Anything else that stands out? <clears throat> Dana, anything that stands out to you? And the last part. That you cannot um, buy God, the gift of God with money. I don't think you've got that far yet. Okay, we haven't got that far okay. yet. Okay. <laughs> Alright, but notice that the Baptism and confirmation are even then distinguished between the two. So one is the laying on of hands and the connection between baptism and confirmation. And then, as you pointed out, the second passage, when Simon the magician saw that the Spirit was conferred by the laying on of hands, apostles' hands, he offered them money. But Peter said to him, May your money perish with you because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. So again, Confirmation is a gift from God. This means it cannot be bought, sold, earned, or even merited. It is freely given. 
And again, confirmation entails the laying on of hands. What is confirmation? What is confirmation? So again, all the sacraments are a gift from God. So if someone came up and said, Father Jasinski, I'd like to be confirmed tomorrow, I will give you a million dollars. Can I do that? Yeah. Can't buy, you can't sell, I can't sell the sacraments, and you can't buy the sacraments. So that would be a bad thing. And of course, the way things work, if I did it, guess we'd probably die the next day. So what good would the million dollars have done? Yeah. Exactly, where would I go? What is confirmation? What is confirmation? Beth, what is confirmation? It's a gift from God. <laughs> okay. It is a free gift from God. We receive the fullness of the Holy Spirit, which makes us more perfect Christians and soldiers of Christ. Who gave us the seven sacraments? Again, Jesus. You guys should be reciting this in your sleep by now. <laughs> what are the three sacraments of initiation? Hey, what are the sacraments of initiation? Baptism, confirmation, and Eucharist. Baptism, confirmation, Holy Eucharist. Which oil is used in the sacrament of confirmation? Jack, which sacrament, what oil is used? Okay, there's lots of oils out there. Any, any of these oils? Okay, types of oil. The oil that is used, that we're concerned with, is the sacred chrism. You're exactly right. What's, what other sacraments use the sacred chrism? Tiffany, what other sacraments use the sacred chrism? I think just this one. Okay. Then remember, confirmation and baptism, they're separate, but they're closely tied to each other. So this is so this is used actually in baptism as well. Mm -hmm. And when the priest is ordained, bishop or priest are ordained, the sacred chrism is used as well. How about the exorcism? What's that? When the baby's baptized, they exorcise. Okay, the exorcism is different. And there, no oil is used for the exorcism. Okay. But before they are baptized, the oil catechumen or oil of sanctity is used and put on their chest before to strengthen them. And then afterwards, after they're baptized, the sacred chrism is used for baptism. So the sacred chrism for baptism and confirmation ties the two together. Consider the sign of anointing and what it signifies or imprints. Oil is a sign of abundance and joy. It cleanses, it limbers, imprints a spiritual seal. Oil is a sign of healing. It makes us radiate with beauty, health, and strength. By this anointing, what does the confirmed receive? A spiritual seal. Okay. They receive a spiritual seal. They receive the fullness of the Holy Spirit, and it leaves an indelible or permanent mark on your soul. Again, what does what does indelible mean? Beth, what does indelible mean? It cannot be removed. Cannot be removed. So it can't be burned off. Once you receive that sacrament, it is there forever. What is the matter? The essential material is the outward sign of the sacrament of confirmation. What do I need to do? to do or to have, to have a valid confirmation. A and B. A. So both A and B, e, the sacred chrism, but also comes laying on of hands. Basically, it's kind of one, one motion. He does it at the same time as he makes a, lays his hands on your head, makes a sign of the cross. What is the form of this sign? What are the words that have to be used? Yep. Be sealed with the gift of the Holy Spirit. Be sealed with the gift of the Holy Spirit. 
And we'll talk, I think this is the last question. Everyone who's confirmed takes a confirmation name, takes a saint's name. Why, why do we take a saint's name? Is that in the Bible any place where someone's name is being changed when something happens, something important happens? Deb? Simon is changed to Peter. Okay, Simon is changed to Peter. Mm -hmm. Saul is changed to Paul. That's right, Saul is changed to Paul. Very good. Anything in the Old Testament? Or is this just like a New Testament thing? <laughs> what do you think? Anything in the Old Testament? Oh, yeah. Abraham and Abraham. That's right. Abraham mm -hmm. and Abraham, Sarai and Sarah. So we see it in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. Jacob and Israel. Mm -hmm. Jacob and Israel, very good. So there, there's a number of instances where the person's name is being changed. So the same thing happens in confirmation. Something important is happening. And so when you're confirmed, whether it's by the bishop or by your pastor, he will not use your given name. So Tiffany, if you're receiving a church, for example, you'll be asked to receive, take a saint's name. So it won't be Tiffany, be sealed with the gift of the Holy Spirit. If you take Mary, you'd say, Mary, be sealed with the gift of the Holy Spirit. So whatever name you take, a saint's name, that's the name that will be used. Be sealed with the gift of the Holy Spirit. Nine, what are the effects of confirmation? We receive the fullness of the Holy Spirit, which means we are... Unite more firmly to Christ. Increase the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit. Wisdom, counsel, fear of the Lord, knowledge, piety, understanding, and fortitude. Makes us more committed member of the church. Gives us strength to defend and spread the faith. This, this bottom one, this is what I'd like to ask the students. So Jack, if I ask you this question. It says, if you're confirmed, you're strictly obliged to spread and defend the faith. So I always like to ask the confirmandi, at your, after, let's say you're confirmed on Monday, if I went to your, and actually it'll be a Wednesday here, so if I went to your school on Thursday, am I going to see you standing on the cafeteria table with a Bible on one hand, a catechism on the other, spreading and defending the faith? How many of you guys would like to see that with me? Jack standing on the table. <laughs> Absolutely. We'd be all over it. So if, so if Jack is confirmed at the, uh, with, well, let's say with the, the class on Wednesday, am I going to see them Thursday at Yorktown standing on the table with the Bible in one hand, catechism in the other? Do you think I'll see that, Jack? Probably not. <laughs> Why? Because it says you are strictly obliged to spread and defend the faith. It doesn't say if you want to or you feel like it or if you have time. It says it's a strict obligation. So if it's a strict obligation, why wouldn't I see you know, Jack doing that? I always like listen to the students respond because sometimes they're still so literal and they're like, Father, because at my school we're not allowed to stand on the table. <laughs> like that was the only thing that would stop them. <laughs> you grow through understanding and knowledge. It doesn't necessarily flip on like a light bulb. But there's other ways to spread and defend the faith too. You, we have to know what the faith is so we can talk intelligently about it. Because you can reach, everyone in here runs in different circles than I run in. And you can reach other people. So I can help you form your consciences so you know what the truth is. And then the people that you, you meet and you interact with, you have an obligation because there's so many misconceptions about the Catholic faith, but also there's so many questions. And now, so you have the, the knowledge. You say, well, this is what you know, I believe, or this is what we think, and this is why, so that you can help spread and defend the faith. So you don't have to draw attention to yourself to do it. You, know, you just do it in your own quiet ways. Or if you want to stand on the street corner, or if you want to stand on the table, you know, that's great. I'm behind you 100%. Just call me so I can come and see it. <laughs> This is one of Bill's favorite parts. <laughs> the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit, which we just listed before. It always reminds me, 1983, I don't know if you guys were into the NCAA basketball tournament championship. Houston, who was 31 and 2, they were playing North Carolina State for the championship. The championship. Houston was heavily favored. So the Houston Cougars, they were playing. North Carolina State Wolfpack. It came down basically to the last shot of the game, which was made by North Carolina State. And they beat, they upset Houston. And I like this, 
Because if you look at the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit, with the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit, you can come overcome any obstacle. Not necessarily, you know, the basketball. I just mm-hmm. like the analogy. But anything in life, because you have the seven gifts. And so, seven gifts of the Holy Spirit, spell out wolf hack, as opposed to <laughs> wolf hack. So it's just an easy way to remember the gifts. Because part of the problem is, we get these gifts at our baptism, and they're brought to fruition at our confirmation. But if you don't know what the gifts are, what good is it? It's sort of like your muscles. If you don't use your muscles, what good is it? And what happens after a while? is you get atrophy, which basically your mu- muscles just get so weak. It doesn't mean you don't have those muscles, it's just they're so weak because they haven't been used. So it's the same thing with these seven gifts. These seven gifts are to help us live out our Catholic faith. But if we're not, if we don't know what they are, how can we utilize or put them into practice? And sometimes, you, how do we remember? Oh, it's easy, just think Wolfpack. Okay. So again, Houston Cougars against North Carolina State. We see here, that's spelled the same. <laughs> so, what can the Holy Spirit do for you? The Holy Spirit, with the Holy Spirit, anything is possible. Overcoming great obstacles, challenges, trials. Holy Spirit is the third person of the Holy Trinity. Well, I haven't mentioned this for a while. True or false? As Catholics, we believe in three gods: God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. False. False. Tiffany, why is that false? Because they're all the same. Well. They're not they're all the same. There's only one God. one God and three persons. It, which one is Jesus? The Father, Son, or the Holy Spirit, Dana? Which one is Jesus? Father, Son, or the Holy Spirit? Son. So if Jesus is the Son of God, Jack, is he God? Yes. Absolutely. Is the Father God? Yes. Is the Holy Spirit God? Yes. Okay. And sometimes the poor Holy Spirit, he often kind of gets overlooked. People can identify with the Father and the Son, but sometimes he's... They don't always recognize him as God. Which person of the Trinity at one time, though, did not exist? Which person of the Trinity at one time did not exist? Dan? Well, they they all they all existed. They all existed. Sorry, yes. okay, in the future, which one will not exist, though? Oh That's right. They will always exist. By the very definition of God, God always, God always was, always is, and always shall be. So if we said there is a time when they did not exist, they would not be God. So again, the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> so we have wisdom, we have understanding, we have fear of the Lord, we have fortitude, we have piety, we have counsel, we have knowledge. What is piety? Good question. <laughs> Do you know what? What? We're going to get there. Okay. <laughs> He's got select for that. Yeah, we do have <laughs> <laughs> So we have the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit, and it spells out Wolfpack. So we start with wisdom, which is the greatest of the seven gifts. It's always listed first. Wisdom helps us to contemplate God. Wisdom ties all the other gifts together. Wisdom is the greatest of all the gifts, since that's why we always list it first. The reason it's the greatest, again, is that it helps us to contemplate God. In some ways, even though you can't think like the other person, it helps us think like God thinks. Understanding. Again, the Catholic Church may not always be the most creative, but she is the most practical. So if you're going to give someone a gift of understanding, it's to help you what? To, exactly, to understand. In a word, understanding helps us to understand our faith, understand the eternal truths. Fear of the Lord. In a word, what is it? We have this misunderstanding, This actually this modern day understanding of fear. In the scriptures, Fear isn't to be afraid of, in a sense it's a profound respect or awe. So God isn't an 800 pound gorilla who's going to pounce on you if you do something wrong. But it is to give us that proper reverence or respect. Fortitude. Fortitude is not necessarily fool. It's not foolhardiness or rashness, not rushing in where angels dare to tread or doing something crazy like doing a backflip off of. That is not fortitude. So we don't put our bodies in unnecessary danger. But notice fortitude, the first four letters of fortitude spell out fort. So 
You, if you have fortitude, you're in a present sense a position of strength. So what does fortitude do for you? It gives you the strength to live out your Catholic faith. The strength to do the good, to avoid evil, to carry out what the, the right choices that you make to its logical conclusion, which is pleasing to God. So again, if you have the gift of fortitude, you are in a position of strength. Piety. Here you go. <laughs> Far from being a drudgery, worship should be an act of love. And piety is the instinctive affection for God that makes us desire to render love and worship to Him, just as we love and honor our parents. So if you were to ask, Tiffany, what is the name of your baby again? Bailey. Bailey. So when Bailey gets older, <coughs> do you, does Tiffany, would you rather have Bailey do what she says because she's afraid of Bailey and the punishment if she does it, or out of love and respect? Well, hopefully every parent desires that their child do the right thing out of love and respect, and that's what piety is. It helps us to love God the way we should. The way you remember what piety stands for this is kind of what Phil had mentioned over there. True piety and still says a desire always to do that which is pleasing to God and by extension which is pleasing to those who serve God in their own lives. We do this not because we have to, but out of love. Oftentimes people will say, I love pie, or I love peanut M&Ms, or whatever it is. You cannot love things. But that is a hard concept for so many people to understand. You can't love things. And it's also hard because we get so attached to our pets. The reason, and this is what I love about our school though, every one of the students, even the first graders, if I ask them, why can't I love Pi? They can all tell me, you can't love Pi because Pi cannot love you back. Easy to love. But because we have pets, and our pets oftentimes show affection, we think that we confuse that with love. Pet, pets cannot love you. And that's why pets don't have rights. Only man and angels are created in the image and likeness of God. Angels have the capacity to love just as man has the capacity to love as well. So animals, things, other created whatever, they cannot love because they don't have the capacity to love. It's only man and angels that can love. That's why animals don't have rights. They, in no place in the scripture does it say that animals are created in the image and likeness of God, that things are created. They reflect God's beauty and God's greatness, but they are not created in His image and likeness. So if you ever forget, what does piety stand for? Tiffany, just think. Pie. I love pie. Okay. <clears throat> then you have counsel. Counsel helps us to choose. And again, counsel begins with a C. Choose begins with a C. So it helps us to make the to choose to do the good, to avoid the evil. So I put the last one down. It's just an easy way to remember what the gift is all about. And it does tie in wisdom and understanding. Knowledge, the last of the seven gifts, helps us to know our faith, know the truth, so that we can judge between good and evil. These gifts help us to see things as God sees them through a little limited way. Which of the seven gifts helps us to understand our faith in a second only behind wisdom? Okay. Again, understanding. So, which gift helps us to choose to do the good and to avoid the evil? Counsel. counsel. Again, choose begins with a C. Counsel begins with a C. So it's counsel. Which gift, once we have made the right choice or decision, the devil, the world, even our own fallen nature will try to get us to change our mind. Which gives, gives us the strength to see our right choice to its logical conclusion? Fortitude. So the key is strength. And that is, what was that again? Fortitude. fortitude. And again, the first four letters of fortitude spell out fort. Which gives helps us 
To love God the way we should, Tiffany? Piety. Piety. Which is the greatest of seven gifts helps us contemplate God in the things of God? Wisdom. Is wisdom. Which gift helps us to follow God in our Catholic faith, not out of fear of punishment, but out of reverence and respect for God? Atrophy, again, a wasting away of the muscles from lack of use. So you'll get these gifts at your baptism, they'll brought to fruition at your confirmation. So we need to know what the gifts are and we actually put them into, put them into use. The whole thing. If you don't use it, you'll lose it. But the good thing is, it's always with us. And again, even with the sacrament of confirmation, it means to make a covenant with God, the confirmandi. Say, yes, I believe in you, my God. Give me your spirit so that I might belong entirely to you and never to be separated from you. May witness to you throughout my whole life, body and soul, in my words and deeds, on good days and bad. Notice that some, the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit, many of them sound very similar, very close. But if you look at it, for example, the gift of knowledge. If I were to ask you to list the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit, if you could do that, and since that would be the gift of knowledge. If I ask you to stand up here and explain to the rest of the class you know, how they work, that would be the gift of understanding throughout your life, but it's not just enough to know the gifts and to understand them, you actually have to choose to to live out your faith. And so that's a gift of knowledge. But once you live out your faith, as I mentioned, the devil's going to come against you, the world's going to come against you, your fallen nature, because it's going to be easier to, to choose other things that may not be go, keep in accord with our faith, because it's easier. And at that time, you really do need the gift of fortitude to give you the strength to carry it out to its logical conclusion. So it's just not enough to know your faith, to understand it, and to choose it, but you actually have to live it out every day. And that's how all the many ways they kind of interact or, or in, kind of intercept each other and are built off of one another. So the gifts are very important. How many times may one receive a sacrament of confirmation? Once. What other sacraments may you receive only once in your lifetime? Just Baptism holy and holy orders. Who may receive the sacrament of confirmation? Any baptized person, not yet confirmed, who is at least in eighth grade, at least in our diocese, and desiring to be confirmed. Anyone in the RSA may receive the sacraments of initiation together as well. What if I don't want to be baptized because I have a phobia for water? And I just want to skip that one. But much better. Communion? That would be awesome. We're kind of all in communion with one another. You see the confirmation, get the Holy Spirit. Can I skip baptism and go right to communion and confirmation? No. You have to be baptized first before you can receive any of the sacraments. What about in danger of death? Who can receive this sacrament? So if that little baby were in danger of death, could he or she be confirmed? Yes. That's right. As long as they were baptized, or if you baptize, you can confirm right away. So in emergency, in case of danger of death, the baby could be baptized. What about this lady? If she's 100 years old, she's going to die anyway. Does, okay, really, is the sacrament going to do any good? Does, could she be baptized and confirmed? Yes. Absolutely. Because we want to make sure that we are disposed and we have every tool, every grace we, we can get to help us get to heaven. So, in danger of death, any baptized person, even a baby. Before, Being, I'm yes. sorry, but we all have the opportunity to baptize if it's needed, but we don't have the ability to confirm. That's right. All right. So, in an emergency, as we talked about when we went over the sacrament of baptism, in an emergency, anyone may baptize. Even an atheist, someone who does not believe in God. All you need is a Trinitarian formula. I baptize you in your Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And just plain natural water. So what if you, before you came here, I see some of you guys had Coke. Let's say you went to the Speedway, you got a 64-ounce <laughs> thing of Sprite. Half ice, half Sprite. 
which is illegal in New York City. If you, <laughs> if you left here and you came across an accident, could I use the Sprite to baptize someone? No. What if it were flat? Could I use it then? No. No. What could I use? Ice. The ice. So do I just pelt the baby with the... Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> say, you, you just melt. So if it's snowing, you could use the snow. If there's water in the, uh, the ditch. So an emergency, it's just plain natural water. It doesn't even have to be holy water, just plain natural water. Did somebody say, like... A couple weeks ago, last week, that you could use saliva. Uh huh. You could in emergency, you could use your saliva as well. Because in emergency, you want to make sure the baby is is baptized. What does it mean to be in a state of grace? We should not be conscious of any serious sin. Therefore, we ask those who are to be confirmed if they haven't been baptized that they would go, to, if they have been baptized, they would go to the second confession. If they haven't been baptized, they don't have to go to con confession because baptism will take away any, any sin. So for those in the RCI program that have been baptized, they will actually go to confession before the Easter Vigil. So that way they can receive these other sacraments in a state of grace. Who is the ordinary minister who usually administers the sacrament confirmation? And that is the bishop. He's the ordinary and the bishops usually hold, you know, uh, guard that very jealously, the sacrament. So, but at the Easter Vigil, again, that's the whole point, is to bring people into the church, baptized, confirmed, first communion. There's no way the bishop could get around to 62, 63 parishes. So that is to delegate to the pastors or to the priests. Speaking of bishops, hopefully everyone knows who our bishop is. Does everyone know who our bishop is? Our bishop is Bishop Dorothy. Dorothy. So if you see this guy, that's our bishop. Does everyone know the name of our diocese? Yes. Diocese of Lafayette. And diocese Indiana. of Lafayette. Yeah. All right, so this is our, our diocese. Every diocese has a cathedral. Does everyone know where our cathedral is located? Lafayette. So again, the Catholic Church may not be the most creative, but she's the most practical. So if you're going to have kind of the seat, which is what cathedral means, the seat of the diocese, you're going to put it in Lafayette. Where is the cathedral for Gary located? Gary. Where is the cathedral for the Archdiocese of Indianapolis? Indianapolis. What's the name of our cathedral? Does anyone remember the name of our cathedral? St. Mary. St. Mary. Sorry. So that's kind of neat that we have a holy door here and the cathedral in Lafayette makes the connection with St. Mary here in the, our, our, this end of the diocese. May a priest ever confirm? If so, when? Yes, when delegated by the bishop or danger of death. Okay, for serious reason with proper delegation. And that was, comes from the bishop, like you said, at the Easter Vigil or if a baptized person is in danger of death. Who may be a sponsor? Basically, if you look at this list, everything that a baptismal sponsor is the same with the confirmation sponsor. So on this list, I think there are two that cannot be cannot be sponsors. Actually, there's three. Yeah. Look at there are three things, three that cannot be. That would be your parents can't be a sponsor either in the a non-Catholic and a non-practicing Catholic. Not the parent, godparents, and it's preferable to have as your sponsor your godparent, whoever was your godparent for baptism, to show again show the connection between the two sacraments. After at least 16, practicing Catholic, already been conferred, made the first communion, say the grace, living a good Catholic life, if they're married, must be recognized by the church. Why do you think a non-Catholic or a Catholic who is not practicing the faith cannot be a sponsor? <coughs> Because the Catholic Church is mean. No, they, they have to be responsible and, and support the new well, Exactly. So how can someone say, you need to be living the faith if I'm not doing it myself? You need to go to Mass if I'm not going to Mass. You need to get married in the church if I'm not getting married in the church. You can't live with your boyfriend or girlfriend if I'm not, if I'm living with my boyfriend or girlfriend. So you have to be living the faith so that you can be that valid witness the authentic witness. Okay. 
And if you're not Catholic, how can you know what the Catholic Church teaches if you're not if you're not living it out yourself? And of course, you need to be able to rebuke. So if you're going astray or becoming lax, how can I rebuke you if I'm not doing it myself? True or false, the Bible talks about the sacrament of confirmation. True, true. Absolutely. We just saw that at the beginning. These places, Acts 19, Acts 8, 2 Corinthians 1. Why do you or why would why do you or why does anyone want to be confirmed, do you think? Why would you want to be confirmed? Tiffany, why would you want to be confirmed? Any idea? What is the point of all the sacraments? What do they help us do? Where do they help us go? That's right. They help us get to heaven. So it helps us live out our faith, helps us get to heaven. So that we can become when we say holy, basic God we can become the person that God has created us to be. We can't do that by ourselves. We need God's grace. And it also helps us become a more committed member of the church. So any of these would be great reasons if the bishop were to ask you, why do you want to be confirmed? What is, why do I even want to go to heaven anyway? Why would I even want to go to heaven? Why do you think? Ask you, why do I want to, why do you want to go to heaven? Well, because God promised us that he would be there for us and that he created us and I would like to meet my creator. <laughs> If okay. he loves me that much, I wouldn't be. Okay, because we want to be with the one that we love, and it's only in heaven that we'll find perfect happiness or true happiness. And in a lesser note, it beats the alternative too. So. <laughs> but that should not be the driving force. As Patsy said, it should be love. You know, so if I were to ask you, for those of you who are married, why do you want to go home after this class? Well, to say, because I don't want to sleep in my car, you can't, that's... <laughs> that might be true, but it's not a good reason. Because you want to be with your family. You want to be with your beloved. It's the same way with heaven. Someone who has been confirmed is strictly obliged to do what? And Jack has already told, talked about this extensively. To spread and defend the faith. Strictly spread... <laughs> There's Jack. I don't know why he's little. <laughs> I'm teasing Jack. That's what does Hebrews 6.2 mean in reference to baptism and laying on of hands? Okay. You see the hands is seen as the origins of confirmation and what completes was begun in baptism. Perpetuates the grace of Pentecost in the church. 22, literally, what does the word Christian mean? What does Christian mean? Okay, anointed one. And that's what that's why we talk about Christ. Christ is the anointed one of God. In the West, how did baptism, confirmation, the Eucharist get separated? As the church began to spread, the bishop held was the one who would go around and baptize, confirm, give the first communion. But as it began to spread, it was harder and harder, so it was getting delayed. So uh, over time, baptism was done by the priest, and they'd wait for the bishop to come around. And obviously, they didn't have trains, planes, and automobiles, so travel was very slow. And eventually, it kept getting pushed further and further out. Twenty-four. What does it mean to say that the sign of confirmation place a double mark on your soul? Again, hopefully everyone knows this. You should be able to recite, answer this in your sleep. And for which sin removes the indelible mark left by the sign of confirmation? Jack, which sin takes off that that mark? And no sin can take it off. Once it's there, it's there forever. You may lose the grace of the sacrament, but what is oil a sign of? Abundance, joy. I mentioned that earlier. Liver is a sign of healing, soothing, makes us radiant beauty. 26. When confirmation is separated from baptism, why do we have the renewal of baptismal promises and profession of faith? To show that confirmation follows baptism. What does it mean to say that confirmation is a sacrament of Christian maturity, not to be confused with chronological age? So when we think of maturity, oftentimes we think of someone who is older. So maturity or adult faith is not to be confused with adult age. 
but basically natural growth, free unmerited, it helps us live out our faith. So we see many of the uh, martyrs who are young had an adult faith. So even though they were just children, they were able to die, be martyrs for the faith. Why do we, why do those who are confirmed take the name of a saint? So hopefully everyone knows Again, notice we talked about how we find in the scriptures, but the three eyes, the saints are aware. They're in heaven. So they intercede for us with God face to face. Gives us someone to imitate. So when Andrew Luck, when he gets back to full speed, everyone will be like Andrew Luck. Well, that's great, but Andrew Luck isn't necessarily going to help him get to heaven. But the saints will, because the saints have been through everything we, we've been through. And they see, behold God face to face. But they also inspire us to want to live a good and holy life. Want to help us to do better. I know I just kind of rushed through the last couple very quickly so that we would have time, you know, at least you could get exposure to what we're, we're talking about. Does anyone have any questions? Any questions? Jack? So, like, when you say take their name, uh-huh. do you have to actually take your name, or is it just in the church? It's just in the church, so no, you don't say you take it Jack to John. So, but it is. A, but that's a good question. But when you're confirmed, so in a sense, even maybe how the saints might relate to you. You know, if you're if you take the name John, they would call you John because that's how they would know you through the sacraments. But no, you don't legally change your name. It's just the name that you're taking that you'll be confirmed, and that you have that saint as a special intercessor in heaven now. Okay. Anything else? Can I buy one of these books? You know what? Yeah. We'll give one to you. You may take it. Awesome. Thank you. Because every home should have a catechism. It is a, it's a wonderful gift that the church has given to us. So you may have that. Thank you. Let's close with a prayer. Then you can go in peace. I'd like to stand. October is dedicated to respect life, but also to the Holy Rosary and our Blessed Mother. So I ask Mary's intercession, may the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. As we quote from the Bible, we pray. Hail, Hail Mary, Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Go in peace. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Amen. Amen. Very good.